Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. That was better, wasn't it? Wow, that's the difference football can make. Um, I'm pretty sure that everyone this morning heading into work or whatever you were doing, you still had a little bit of a buzz. A bit of a buzz going from yesterday's game. Um, you know, that second half performance, um, a lot of the kind of aspects of the entire display, but mainly the second uh, half performance, the result going to one of the most difficult stadiums that the Premier League's had this season. You know, Villa had won 17 in a row there only until a few weeks back. Um, Spurs went there knowing they had to get the job done. They did it and then some. Um, honestly, it's it's a terrific one. It gives us loads to talk about today. Loads of little kind of analytical bits and pieces around certain players, around the system. And, you know, I did not think the day was going to go that way. I, I won't lie, I was a little bit grumpy in the morning. Uh, very early start, up at 5am, something like that, to uh, to get the train up to uh, Birmingham. It was drizzly, it was grey, it was a horrible day. Got wet kind of walking into the stadium, got wet coming out of the stadium. Uh, where I was sat in the media box, uh, the press box, it was kind of leaking, or there was drips coming down from the Villa Park roof, which was going not only on my head, but on my laptop as I was trying to work. Look, again, as always, I won't go overboard, because I completely admit, you know, I'm getting in there on a press pass. I'm not having to pay and make my own way like these uh, many of them. I think it was about just under 3,000 fans, something like that, made their way up there as well to do. But... Look, I was just in a bit of, this is rubbish, it's going to be rubbish, Spurs are going to lose, Villa are really good. And all of that was blown away um, by, a, yeah, a decent performance on the whole, especially the second half. Because, um, yeah, I mean, Villa have been very good this season, they really have. And, you know, in Ollie Watkins, they've got probably one of the informed strikers in Europe right now. Spurs absolutely negated so much against Villa uh, or Villa Villa did a, a bit of that themselves I think there's there's an aspect of Emery being worried how the reverse fixture went at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium when Spurs absolutely battered them should have been 4-0 up at half time and didn't take their chances and Villa managed to get a couple of goals in the second half um, or was it one before half time I can't remember now. but either way they didn't take their chances. And I think Emery had that in the back of his mind. So he switched to a back five. They were quite a little bit boring, Villa, compared to how I've seen them in previous uh, matches. I think partly also to do, they've got a real lack of midfielders there. They have even more of a lack of midfielders now after John McGinn's um, bizarre moment. But yeah, Spurs were, were so brave. That was the thing I think I enjoyed the most about it. Some of the bits that terrify me the most about Spurs, I enjoyed as well. Because I think that's why Postacogli was so happy after the game. Because they did everything he asked of them. Um, he, he made a kind of... He always, always will back his team 100% if they're doing what he wants of them. And they did. They were playing out from the back. And, and I still see people saying, why are they playing out from the back? Why are they playing it side to side out of the back? Because that's supposed to Cockley way. <laughs> if you haven't got this by this point in the season, you know, what's he been there? Seven months, eight months or so now. I'm afraid I don't think you're ever going to fully understand the Poster Cockley way. They are going to play out from the back. They are going to give us heart, um, you know, palpitations um we are going to be like there yeah! when they do those kind of passes that just sometimes sneak past the toe or sometimes don't of the attacker certainly as a Basuma and Romero did a couple that did go to Villa but ultimately there's a logic behind it as terrifying and and as I say brave as it is um, it is to get the opposition out of position. So even when they're flicking it back and forth, back and forth between uh, Romero and Van der Ven, and you're thinking, why are you playing it side to side? It is to shift the midfield and strikers across to see whether a suddenly a little bit of space can open up. And you'll see yesterday was a really clear kind of way for me of seeing the system work in exactly how it was meant to work. There were a few times when Van der Ven would shift it to Romero. Romero would have the ball at his feet. And suddenly he would spot that one of the Villa strikers had slightly come out of position and he would play it like a rocket pace 
through the middle, either it could be to Basum or it could be to Saar, or he would suddenly play it out to Poro because they sensed, a bit like a coiled snake, they just sensed that there was this opportunity to strike, and they would. Um, first half, first uh, final ball let them down a lot. Um, there was a lot of really good build-up play, like I say, playing it out from the back, getting around the Villa press, playing it down the flanks really well, and then just, they would play a really poor final ball. Um, it would get cut out by the foot of a Villa defender, or there were times when one of the wingers, mainly Kulisevsky in the first half, would try to beat his man, fail, and lose the ball. Um, but a lot of the other stuff Spurs did, actually, they did really well. Um, the pressing was wonderful. You know my views on this. The best version of Tottenham Hotspur is an aggressive, snarling, pressing version of Tottenham Hotspur. I will say it until I will have that on my gravestone. It will look a bit weird on a gravestone, but that is exactly what I would have on it. No, I wouldn't. That's rubbish. But it is something that I will continue to say probably until I'm underneath that gravestone. Because it is the best Spurs. There's... The opposition don't know what to do about that version of Tottenham Hotspur. You looked at Villa yesterday, and from the first minute, Spurs were led by, whether it was Sonny, Brennan Johnson, Saar sometimes from the midfield, pressing high, pacey, running at them, not letting Villa have a chance to settle on the ball. Brennan Johnson especially was excellent. Actually, to be fair, all of them were. Sonny was just a constant running machine. But Brennan Johnson, you could just see, he wanted to make it very clear, I am not just a super sub. I'm going to make my impact from the start of this game. And I thought, probably first half, he was Spurs' best attacker. He was just constantly running at them. He has got the confidence from that two-assist uh, two little cameo last um, weekend. And everything he touched worked. He had little spins and twirls with the ball, skillful moments, dribbles past players, control was lovely. And then you could just... You just know when a, a player is confident, they can stride past an opposition player as if they're not there. It's they, like they've got all the time in the world. When they're caught up in their own thoughts and they've lost confidence, you can see they take that extra touch, they're hesitant and they lose the ball when the opposition senses that. Johnson was a complete opposite. He was so good yesterday. I thought that was up there with one of his best performances actually yesterday. He was, he, um, he was excellent. Um, so yeah, first half was really good. I would say the only Villa opportunities that came were Spurs just messing up little passes around the back, which will happen with this Postacoglu way. Um, like I say, there was oh, there was also Romero had a couple of moments when he let the ball bounce when he shouldn't have. Uh, one of them, uh, Watkins headed and ran on, and Van der Ven mopped up. There was another moment where Poro mopped up as well. I think that might have been the Basuma misplaced pass. Um, so yeah, first half wasn't always pretty. Um, and there was a lot of probing about. It was very tactical. It was trying to find the spaces. And like I say, I can understand why maybe back at home it was a bit like, Ugh, kind of thing. But actually there, it was really fascinating. It was very, like I say, a tactical battle, seeing how it all unfolded, even though I was getting drips from the uh, Villa Park roof on my head. Um, I was more concerned about my laptop suddenly dying or exploding. But uh, hey, that's 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 part of the job. Um, still nothing as bad as St James's Park um, last season when we were just caught in a monsoon and the uh, Newcastle United media area is not properly covered. The rain gets in and, and we had to actually uh, kind of go inside because everything was about to die, all the electrical equipment. Um, although I know you guys are up in the gods at St James's Park, so I'm not entirely sure I envy that either. Um, but yeah, yeah, back to yesterday. Yeah, terrific one, really, uh, overall. They just suddenly um, kind of found their groove in the second half. Now, it came for me, Postacoglu completely disagreed with me, but I I thought it came, it was kind of a key moment for me, and it was when Mickey van der Ven went down, holding his hamstring and signalled to the bench. I kind of feel like maybe earlier in the season, certainly in previous versions of Tottenham Hotspur, if they'd seen one of, if not one of the best young defenders in Europe right now one of their key players goes down injured I kind of feel like Spurs might have crumbled a little bit and, and, and just kind of thought the worst but they looked across and saw Radu Dragashin come on who did very well we're going to talk about him um, and I just felt like Spurs were like no no, no we got this and pretty much from that within 60 seconds or so 
they scored a beautiful goal. You know, Dejan Kulisevsky down the uh, right-hand side, tried to play one pass, it was cut out, played it to Poro, did a lovely little one-two, knocked into the path of the on-rushing Saar, he sprinted down the right, and he put in a Beckham-like cross. That's how good it was. It was sublime. He curled it to the only, like on a sixpence, the only spot in that six-yard box where James Madison, who is no giant, we know this, ha- could get in between two centre-backs and poke that ball into the net. It was a brilliant goal. It was a Postacoglu moment of football from start to finish. So they did that straight after the Van der Ven disappointment. Three minutes later, bang, hit them for a sucker punch again um, with Brennan Johnson's strike. All led Brennan Johnson's pressing. Brennan Johnson pushing, pushing, pushing. Villa player, I can't remember who it was now, forced into a pass that went across. Kulisevsky read it perfectly, got his foot in instead, knocked it to Son. Son runs in, knocks it off to the side to um, Brennan Johnson, who curls it into the roof of the net while falling. Um, Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Um, And, you know, I think... um, Earlier in the season, perhaps, or or other points, you know, we've seen Spurs maybe not go for the throat quite how, uh, you know, they really should. And uh, they did this time. So I'm oh, actually saying that we still had something else, didn't we, that happened just before that. Um, <laughs> well, let's put it this way. Um, John McGinn said some words before the game, which were quite right. And I think it was a good galvanising little kind of quote. I only saw some of them, but essentially... He said, um, everyone knows how important the game is. It's probably, in a league fixture, the most important game in the club's recent history, and the players are aware of that. So this is the captain. This is Villa captain, John McGinn, who's a terrific player. I really like John McGinn. He's one player in the uh, Premier League that I always love to watch, who I think would fit in pretty much almost every team in the Premier League. I think he's that good. But my goodness, he did not listen to his own words. Uh, what a switched-off brain moment that was. Uh, Destiny of Doggy, who kept raiding up and down the left-hand side, getting so much space. Um, and it was almost like McGinn went, no, don't, stop doing that. And he swiped out this kick at him, which was it was very unpleasant. I, it was one of those where I don't think he meant it maliciously, as in, like, I'm trying to injure you. I think he was just trying to say, get on the floor, kind of thing. Just, like, trying to knock him over. Um, like, just pure frustration that he had sprinted past him again. Um, and you could see, like, the in- incredulity, of, incredulity of the uh, Spurs players. Even uh, a doggy, like, jumped up as if to go, like, what in the world was that? And then two things happened. I think one, he realised, ow, I actually hurt. And he kind of went back on the floor. And secondly, he probably maybe thought to himself, if I jump up there and start a scene, they might not even look at the actual incident itself and instead look at like the big furore afterwards because you had Johnson and Madison went steaming in there to kind of stick up for their the young left back. Um, and, you know, Poster Cogley was having to pull some of them away from him and... It was the most obvious red card ever. There was this weird moment when I looked down and John McGinn was stood in not too far in front of the um, the press box on the pitch. And he was going, he'd only shown the red card. He was starting to head towards the tunnel. And then he stopped on the grass before he went, just like looked round as if to say, mm, VAR, VAR going to overrule this? We're going to get back on the pitch? And the referee, Chris Cavanagh, just kind of looked at him and just went, Get off! Can <laughs> they just point and just go? As if they what? What world does that get re um, in stage? You know, does it what? What does that get overturned? It was just such a stupid. I saw Ollie Watkins afterwards um, trying to claim that there was, you know, he didn't think it was a red card. I'm sorry. Every day of the week, that's a red card. Um, it, it could have been dangerous. You know, it really could have. It, could have kind of caught his knee, could have caught some studs in the ground, could have, anything could have happened. It was such a stupid challenge. Um, even Emery, I don't think, from anything I've seen, that it has complained about the challenge at all. And the daft thing for Villa, which is a big thing for Spurs, bearing in mind how much they've just praised John McGinn before this, they lose their captain now for three games. Um, and, and they're big ones. I think they've got Wolves, maybe West Ham, Man City, I think, as well. Um, and they're losing one of their kind of chief creators and biggest players in the centre of that pitch when they've already got 
some injury worries in the midfield or injury problems in the midfield. Um, so yeah, it was a moment of utter stupidity. It's funny, isn't it? On a day when I think you always do this with your own club, but you worry about your own players' um, sense of duty and control and all of that and discipline and and you think like oh is Romero going to go for Matty Cash is Benteke going to come on and like smash him in the ankles or something um and as it was every Spurs player was really controlled even Pat Matasar's yellow card and that was the only yellow card until Dragashin got one later on Pat Matasar kind of slipped over it was a very unfortunate yellow card Spurs just did everything so well yesterday um, and yeah, and it was left to Villa to lose their heads in what was a huge game at home. And that Villa crowd was so quiet after such a noisy start. It's a great stadium. It is that and Goodison Park for me are the two White Hart Lane esque stadiums where you can kind of feel that old vibe about it. But Spurs just quieted them down. They had so much possession, they had 70% of the possession. Um, and I think 632 passes to Villa's 229 I've written down here. Villa only had one shot on target the whole game. And all you could hear were the Spurs fans. Spurs fans, as always, brilliant travelling fans. Matty, Matty, what's the score? I heard that a few times uh, targeted towards Matty Cash. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was just all Spurs you could hear. And um, that red card was so mad. It was so mad. Um what did Postacoglu say about the red card? He said, I don't think the red card was a key moment. Um, I thought we were well in control at 2-0 up. Obviously, it made the game a bit easier for us in terms of territory, but I thought we were well in the ascendancy. I think it was just a byproduct of the pressure we were putting on the opposition. I don't think John meant any malice by it. I think it was probably just frustration more than anything else. I felt quite a few decisions were going against us on the day. Little niggly ones. I can't believe Pap was the only one who got a yellow card today. I think he forgot Dragashin, but I don't think it changed the game. We were well in control by that point. And like I said before, I um, talked about the red card, Spurs sometimes don't go in for the kill. They went in for the kill. It could have been, you know, 5, 6, 7 nil on the day. Um, they kept pushing and just maybe through just some decision-making kind of issues and, and Villa also really packing out their, their box with their remaining players at times. It wasn't until um, you know the 90th minute or so that uh, that Spurs got their next goal, which was another really nice little kind of one-two between Poro and Kulusevski. Kulusevski runs into the box, pulls it back for Sonny, who rockets a shot into the roof, and it was a, that it was the finish of a supreme world-class player at his peak right now, full of confidence. Um, the leader of the team, and yeah, terrific, terrific goal. And Kulusevski's first assist of 2024. Um, I think he'll know that has to change. He's a, a funny, funny game um, yesterday. Like I say, first half, I actually thought it was quite poor. Um, every time he ran at his man, he'd lost the ball. Just wasn't working for him. And, you know, in any other game, maybe, with Werner and Johnson playing well recently, you'd take Kulusevski off. But Postecoglou kept faith with him. And was rewarded. He had a part in the first three goals. All of them. He played a big kind of intrinsic role in them. Um, and in the fourth goal, it was almost like Sonny took it upon himself. Again, three minutes between the goals, like the first two goals. Sonny took it upon himself like, no, no, no. It might be the 93rd minute, but we can still do just something here. Uh, and he ran into the box, pulled it back for Timo Werner. Maybe the best finish of the game. Um, really lovely first time. Uh, kind of almost slight curl on it, just placed, I guess is the best way to put it, inside the right-hand post. Um, yeah, between that and, and Sonny's finish for me, uh, again, a player with confidence. A player, um, just, you know, back-to-back -back goals for Timo Werner now as well. So, um, yeah, it, it was a terrific scoreline. It destroyed the goal difference between the two teams. That is the beauty of when they play against each other, that the goal difference can completely flip around. Um, Spurs just made Villa look like a team. We mentioned this in the previous video. They looked like a team that had played on Thursday night against Ajax. They did. They looked like they had an extra game in their legs. 
Um, and it sounds like Postacoglu made that very clear to Spurs as well, uh, especially at half time. Like, if you just keep hunting them down as a pack, they are going to tire. Um, Guesty said he saw that Watkins said they were tired somewhere um, at some point. So, uh, yeah, it's just, um, it is incredible. Um, it really is kind of, uh, this is what Spurs should play like for me week in, week out. Especially when you've got seven, eight days between every game. There is no reason why they shouldn't be the fittest, fasti fastiest, fittest, fastest, most aggressive, in a good way, team in the Premier League. Because, yeah, like I said, when Spurs play like that, I don't see any team that doesn't struggle against them. Any team. And I, I'm talking about Man City and Liverpool as well. When, when Spurs play like that, those kind of teams struggle to get around them. Um, you know, I'm not saying Man City and Liverpool don't have the quality to kind of find uh, moments around that. But I always think it gives Spurs the best chance in these big games. And, uh, and this was a big game. This was a game... <clears throat> the pressure was on them to go and win, you know, win or be left behind pretty much. And they went to Villa Park. They took away a terrific result. Let's be honest, 4-0 away from home. That's psychologically huge for Spurs and it's psychologically damaging for Villa. Um, for Spurs, it shows that they can, you know, do it in these kind of clutch moments. But it also shows that they can fully, if they didn't already, believe in the Postacoglu process because they played the Postacoglu way. They obviously could have been a bit more quality in the first half, in the final third, but everything they did was kind of the way he wanted them to play. All four goals were the kind of Postacoglu goals down the flank, pull the ball into the middle kind of goals. Um, and yeah, it was, a, <coughs> excuse me, it would have done them the world of good. Um yeah, um, quotes I've got here from Postacoglu to the BBC. We were outstanding in all facets. First half, we made them work really hard. We maintained that tempo with our pressing and the quality of our football. And the second half was outstanding against a very good team. It was a big game with plenty of, sig of significance. So for us to perform like that was a big credit to everyone. I felt towards the end of the first half, they were working awfully hard to try and press us. That was the message at half-time, that just perseverance would get us there today. We went on. We didn't stop playing our football. Great focus, I thought, today. Um, if we could impose our intensity and tempo on the game for 100 minutes, we'd be hard to stop. It's not easy, especially away from home, but I thought we handled ourselves really well. It means we're one game closer, just 11 games to go. Everyone was billing this as a do-or-die for us. I assume we're not dead yet. Um yeah, like I say, I did think the Van der Ven exit moment was quite a big one. I thought in terms of psychologically how well the team dealt with that was quite big to instantly go up the other end and score instead. Um, as I say, Postacoglu completely disagreed with me. Uh, he said, I don't think that was the key. He said, the whole game I was really pleased with the way we handled the whole day. Obviously, we knew it was a significant game coming here. Tough venue, good opponent. I just thought, obviously, atmosphere here. They get behind their team. I thought with all of that, the context of all of that, first half we did really well. Just to make them work hard more than anything else. They had to try to contain us and the threats they had we snuffed out. I had a sense towards the back end of the first half they were beginning to really tire a little bit. That was the message at half time. Just to persevere, stay calm, play our football, maintain the intensity, which is going to be important. And we did. We got off to a flyer and the quality of our football was excellent to see out the game. So, yeah, I don't know whether he thought uh, that I was trying to kind of make out, you know, Spurs didn't start playing until Van der Ven went off. That's not what I was saying at all. It was more psychologically, I thought, they, yeah, they dealt with it really well. But that's fine. And Ange likes his, uh, he likes to kind of make sure you haven't sussed him out. That's one of his big things. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a big, uh, one giant leap for Tottenham, I felt. But they've got to maximise it. They've got to kind of build on it. It's no good going to Villa Park and pulling off a terrific performance or result like that. And then you go to Craven Cottage and you lose. You've got to uh, you've got to back it up with with something tangible and um, and uh, longer standing as well. So um, yeah, <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's mad. I'm just seeing some of this. So much. You just see the difference in even social media as well. It just, just for a day, becomes less toxic among the Spurs fans. It's lovely. Um, yeah. Not the club helped that this week, of course, themselves. Uh, yeah. And I think one of the big things as well for me and for Postacoglu, and more importantly Postacoglu than for me, um, was that all the attacking players played their part in the goals. You know, we weren't seeing having to see um, defenders chip in with the goals or fullbacks or anything like that. This was all these attacking players, the front quartet, if you're going to improve Madison, all kind of doing what they had to do um, as well. Yeah, I mean, that's the part where if you ask Postacoglu, is this when will we know this is a Tottenham Hotspur? Uh, sorry, a Postacoglu Tottenham Hotspur. He will always say, not until we are essentially battering teams. Um, that is what it is. A Postacoglu team in its kind of premium version is one that is creating chances galore. It's just a dominating machine of a team that is, yeah, he's winning games 3-0, 4-0, 4-1, 5-1, -1, whatever. Um, and this was probably the first result where we kind of saw maybe that dominance turned into a, a scoreline. Uh, like I said, a reverse fixture against Villa really should have brought something like that, as Emery and Watkins at the time attested to. Um, but yeah, I mean, that first ball was real quality uh, from Saar uh, and that's the kind of the difference that it makes as well um, and I'm surprised Saar stayed on for the second half he uh, obviously got a yellow card but more so that he got a big whack just before the half time whistle which should have been a foul and even Postacoglu you could see was bewildered by it wasn't a foul given to Spurs and I think Villa actually came up and had a not a decent chance but they, they got near the Spurs goal um, and I thought, oh, Sars maybe not going to come out. We might see Benton for the second half. But that is one of the terrific things about Pat Matasai. You know, what is he, just 21 years old? Is that you can trust him when he's on a yellow card? I mean, cue him getting a red somewhere. But so far, every time he's had a yellow card, he's been incredibly disciplined and focused in the uh, in the remainder of the game. And and so he was yesterday. Um it was honestly it was such a breathtaking move the one for Madison's goal and, and for Madison now that's 12 goal involvements in 17 Premier League games four goals eight assists um, and he's capable of a, a lot more um, and I think that's something that Postacoglu knows I think that's something that Madison knows but he's getting sharper and that's the brilliant thing um, Sticking with those attackers, Brennan Johnson, obviously, like I say, big game for him. Big game, like I say, to show that he's not just a super sub, that he can start games and make a huge impact from the very first whistle as well. Matty Cash had a bit of a nightmare with him. That's the best way to get your own back on Matty Cash in a way, is is just to, you know, the slough-born Poland international, which always makes me uh, laugh at how diverse the world is, especially in football and international football. Um... But yeah, um, he did not enjoy coming up against Brennan Johnson. And that's uh, another thing as well, is with Brennan, you kind of, I think I often prefer him on the right-hand side, but actually he's showing now he knows how to impact games on the left. He's he's very good with both feet, um, and he can get down that left-hand side and really create loads of problems as well as he can on the right. So yeah, that's that was really important for him. And like I say, just the the confidence in him and the way he was using the ball. Um, yeah, very good. It was Johnson's third goal in six Premier League matches, his seventh goal involvement in his past 10 Premier League matches, three goals and four, four assists. Um, yeah, you know, it does make you wonder what all the fuss was about. Like, why is he getting flack? I think we said it a million times in these as well. Um, you know, he... Uh, he was just a young player. He is a young player trying to learn adapt. He's 22 years old. And I just love the little run that he's now got himself in. He's in the groove. He's he's found what his role is at Spurs. He's understanding the Postacoglu way. He's linking up with the other players. They know where he's going to run. They know where to find him. Um, it's almost like you have to adapt. Incredible. Incredible stuff that we, uh, we could never possibly see coming. Um, young player has to adapt. 
I'm sorry, I'm being very facetious, but you know, you know my views on people that just unnecessarily write people off um, and how, uh, especially young players as well. Um, you know, uh, hey, hey, I don't need to say any more. Brennan Johnson's doing the uh, the talking with his with his feet and with his performances as well. Brilliant. Long may it continue as well. Um, and he's not the only one. Um, you know, um, like I say, Sonny, uh, I know Sonny doesn't have to prove anything to anyone, but with that finish, he's now got 14th Premier League goal of the season, that was. Um, that is... How many has he got now? 22 goal involvements in 24 Premier League games. Um, 159 goals for Spurs now, which takes him up to joint fifth in the club's all-time goal scorer ranking. Is joint with Cliff Jones. I think that's very fitting that two wingers mainly can have so many goals for the club. Um, you know, the Welsh wing wizard himself and uh, and Sonny. It's brilliant. Someone I saw suggesting. I don't know where it was suggesting, or it was, it was a foreign tweet, but I saw the translation. Um, and they used the word Mount Rushmore in it, and I thought that was lovely. And it just kind of made me think, can you imagine down the Tottenham High Road having like all these giant Mount Rushmore-sized heads of Spurs goal scorers that have scored loads in the past? That would be brilliant. I don't think the local residents would like it, but it would it would look superb. Um, to some little kind of mountain somewhere. I'm not really sure you could get that in the middle of North London, but uh, yeah, it just kind of made me chuckle thinking about it. So yeah, so that was Sonny. Um, Timo Werner, of course. Timo Werner has now got... Um, what has he got? He's got four goal involvements in his first seven matches back in the Premier League. It's not bad for a flop. <laughs> if that's a flop, I think we should all be flopping. Um, because, yeah, I mean, every passing game, I do feel like he's making that 15 million or so fee to make his move permanent look all the more of a no-brainer, honestly. Just to bring him in, get him through the door permanently. If he if it doesn't work out for him, I think you make a profit on him. But I do think he'll actually become a really important member of this squad. Um, like I say, with confidence, you saw the player yesterday, I think, that you saw at Leipzig. You saw the player that as soon as the ball came into his path, knew exactly what to do with it and arrowed it right inside the right-hand post. Um, it makes yeah, such it's confidence. It's just it's such a silly, obvious thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, so all the attackers doing really well. And Kudusevsky... His kind of important thing for me is that he just needs to build on his unpredictability. Again, only 23 years old. You know, we talk about Johnson being 22 and being young, and Decky is only 23. He needs to kind of utilise his right foot more. At times, you know, he either won't look to use it or he'll put in a ball that isn't as good as we know he can put in with his left. And for him, that's going to be something that he has to work on. And he is a hard trainer. He's a listener. I think that was quite a key thing as well. I don't think it's any coincidence that uh, Kuda says he sometimes can have a bit of an iffy first half and then comes out in the second half absolutely flying. And I think it's because he takes on board everything that Foster Coglu or the coaching staff are saying to him. Um, and he comes out a better player in the second half. Um, and I guess it's all elements of that as well and taken on more and more on the training ground as well. But it's just, I guess, the idea of that having this competition now. You know, you've got Werner coming on and scoring goals. You've got Johnson coming in and scoring goals or uh, producing assists. You've got Kulisevsky involved in three of the four goals. You've got Sonny, who's just a machine. You've got Madison contributing. You've got, even Lo Celso didn't even get on yesterday. And you know he's got goals and him assists as well. Um, you've got uh, Richarlison still to come back in. You've got Mana Solomon still to come back in. And I have no doubt in the summer that Postacoglu will want further attacking recruits. Um, you know, I haven't even mentioned Brian Hill, who can't even get on the bench right now. Skippy couldn't even get on the bench yesterday. Young Dane Scarlett, who knows what the future holds for him as well. Um, and, you know, so many others that have come in. Lucas Bergvall as an attacking midfielder is in there as well. Alfie Devine, potentially. Uh, Jamie Donnelly, you know. Um, but even just what you've got right now with the competition is is, is superb. And uh, and they're all contributing. 
it did make me chuckle. Um, I didn't like you, you know I don't really look at like kind of replies to ratings and things that I do, but I did see one yesterday and it just really made me laugh. It said something like uh, it was questioning my Sony rating. I think I gave him a nine. Uh, and he said, but yeah, but but what did he do apart from the goal and the two assists? And it's like, that's kind of the point. <laughs> the goal and two assists are what he, he kind of brought to the game. But he also did run his backside off. Uh, but I just thought that was really funny. What else did he do apart from the three goal involvements in the game? But hey, that's football. So I think things sometimes we're so entrenched in how we see something, we refuse to actually accept what really happened. Um Hey, and I'm including myself in that as well. So talking about goals, that uh, obviously extended Spurs' goal scoring streak to 39 matches now. Um, and also for Postacoglu, it meant that he has become Spurs' first manager since Arthur Rowe in 1951 to see his sky side score in each of his first 27 top-flight games. Um, and hey, if you know your history... That first uh, season, Arthur Rowe took Spurs to um, their first ever top flight title uh, with the push and run football. Yeah, 1951. Um, funnily enough, it was the 28th game in which Spurs uh, didn't score against Sunderland that year. Um, and they actually failed to score in two of the next four matches, but then went on to lose just once in the... Um, final 12 games and secured the title so uh hey that would be great <laughs> it'd be lovely if history repeats itself um but yeah it's about this whole attacking side growing this is what poster Cocker keeps saying there's so much growth in that area that's the one where we're going to see and it would be lovely if it's all clicking and coming together in this business end of the season what a time for it to all gel uh, I guess when you've got the players back and fit as well and and having these four weeks on the training grounds to get there. Um, he was asked about uh, Madison kind of finding his way back to sharpness and getting among the goals as well. And he said, Mad has missed a lot of football and he's only just come back. We've got a few like that who are just getting their rhythm back, but it is good for him. It was a really good goal for him because it was as much about his endeavour as his quality and just getting into those areas. These are the kind of things we talk about constantly. We're going to get more reward for our good play and our hard work if those players show the endeavour to get in the right areas and score goals. Matters is one who has to be more advanced. We know he has the quality to score from just about anywhere. It was a really good goal. He attacked that area where we need players to attack. It was a great ball from Pap too. I'm really pleased with our goals. It's stuff we work on and it's great for those individuals today that they all contributed something. Um, yeah, and Madison, he did play well. I did feel there was a few times when... He would get a lot of space in midfield, which was great, but you do kind of want to see him slightly more advanced. But he is always an option to them. You'll always see the fullbacks playing his quick passes inside when he's there. But uh, if he's doing that, then someone like Saar has to push up into a into a more attacking role. And Madison himself was asked by the BBC whether the scoreline surprised him. And he said, not really. Should it have? We knew it was going to be a tough game. They're brilliant at home, but we're also pretty good away. Pretty, pretty good. Two good teams going into a tightly fought contest. He didn't do um, a Larry David impression. Two good teams going into a tightly fought contest and we've come out victorious. It's very satisfying. Um, and on his goal, he said, I've been in the box a lot lately, but it hasn't been falling to me. The manager is always saying, just keep making the runs. It was an unbelievable delivery from Pap and it was just about getting a foot to it. We kind of kick them again while they were down. It's a trend of how we play. It might take us 70 minutes to score one goal, but then we score two in five minutes. I love the way this manager wants us to play. I love the way the team plays, the personnel in this side. It suits me. I feel like I'm getting somewhere close to my best again. Game by game, we're still trying to build something here longer term. Sorry for the boring, cliched answer. Um, yeah, it feels like Spurs are getting better. I didn't even mention Rodrigo Bentenko when I talk about the competition as well. You know, he came on, he looked quite bright. It, it's difficult to judge too much because he was up against 10 men at that point. But, um, you know, he just needs more and more minutes here and there and, and he'll get to where he was as well. And uh, that was probably the strongest Spurs squad I think we've seen in a long time in terms of you look at the bench and it's just packed with game changers and players that can make an impact. Um, 
you know, long gone are the days earlier in the season during the injury crisis when there's three, four, you know, in, uh, academy uh, graduates on the on the bench who just have to be there for the sake of being there almost and maybe aren't likely to come on. Um, you know, this is when I see kind of calls for some of the young players who haven't even had any first team involvement yet. It's like I, I get the excitement. But then you look at what a Timo Werner can do when he comes on, and Brennan Johnson can come on and doing things like that, and you think, okay, it's all it's all going to kind of, it's going to be a little bit of a a process to this. You know, you just can't throw them in there and stump their development. There's certain players I'd like to see get little bits of minutes here and there, but you've got to do it at the right times. Um, and right now, when you look at that Spurs squad, it's strong and it's got a lot of quality in it as well. Um, it may be that some of these young players need loans, like Jamie Donnelly. I think a loan move for him next season would be brilliant, especially with Berval coming in, <clears throat> potentially Alfie Devine coming back if he doesn't go back out on loan. So, um, but yeah, no, I've seen others kind of push to go straight into the team. I just think it's it's a little bit early. Yet. It's, it's a big leap the under twenty ones. Um, so yeah, give them their moment rather than forcing it. it, it I always feel that's the best way. Watching a lot of these. Uh, these young players. Um, so looking at the other end of the pitch as well. Oh, actually, just first off to say, um, Spurs are joint fourth top scorers now in the Premier League, and they have a game in hand. So technically, they could uh, they could be more than that as well. And I just love the fact that Postecoglou's ideas are just starting to the seeds have been planted, and you just may be seeing a little bit more. And, and I really hope in these last eleven games we get a lot of goals, uh, a lot of a lot of goals. Um, so yeah, other end of the pitch. Obviously, the big old four in the scoreline is massive, but I actually think the zero, the big fat zero sat at the front of it was as important in terms of, it was Spurs' only second clean sheet in the Premier League since October. It says a lot about how maybe they haven't get, been getting the rewards for their defending, or maybe they've just been making some kind of daft uh, mistakes here and there. Um, but I just felt... To do that at Villa Park against a team that is so kind of good going forward, uh, that has a player like Watkins, who yeah, he had a couple of moments yesterday, like I say, when he you know Romero misjudged the ball and things like that, but I really felt that he kind of cut a bit of a frustrated figure. I don't think he you know I don't think there was any sense from I saw his interview, I saw Emery's interview that they felt they should have got anything from it. They, they kind of felt like the the Spurs were the better team. Um, and I just felt like for Watkins, if he got past Romero, Van der Ven was there. And then when Van der Ven went off, Dragashin was there. Or if he got maybe down the flanks, or Bailey got down the flanks, you had Udogi there, or Porro was there. Um, I just thought all four of them. I thought Basuma played quite well as well. That pass, a uh, misplaced pass aside, I thought this was another kind of positive... Um, game for him in terms of the way he dominated a lot of the exchanges in the midfield. Um, yeah, he's kind of quietly being effective, Basuma, without being the, the kind of uh, mobile, forward-thinking presence he maybe was in the first 10-11 games or so before he got that red card at Kenilworth Road. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was um, it was really interesting just how good like Van der Ven was superb. Um, he was just absolutely brilliant. He uh, just mops up so much, doesn't he? I, I would honestly, I would go on record quite easily. And this is not the biggest leap in the world, but I would say he's one of the best young players in the world. Sorry, one of the best young centre backs in the world right now. I think he's that good. Postecoglou said it was either last week or the one before how much he's improved from he when he arrived at the club. He said the amount of developing, understanding, and learning he's done just since coming to the club, is phenomenal in the, the last seven, eight months or so. Um, obviously, he did go down um, four minutes into the second half. It was interesting, Tom Barkley from the Sun, who was he stayed outside the crazy fall during half-time rather than going into the warm. He stayed out in the cold and drizzle. Um, but what he did get from that was he saw that Radu Dragashin at half-time was going through some really intense kind of drills with one of the coaches. Um, I don't know, he didn't tell me which coach it was. It might have just been a sports science staff member, but he was going through these really intense drills, almost like maybe Van der Ven had said he had some kind of little issue or could just feel something. Um, and then when he went down, 
my initial thought was he didn't look as devastated as we've seen him, you know, certainly that night against Chelsea. Um, it was very, it felt more like he just got into a challenge to, I think it was to stop Tielemans on the other side. I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, and he, yeah, he just sat down. He kind of came back across and just sat down. Um, and I asked Postacoglu about him afterwards. Oh, actually, my other frustration first before I talk about that. Oh, it was another moment when it was clearly offside. The linesmen is, are told now, don't put your flag up. Let, let it play out or, almost. And that's the second time that Van der Ven has picked up a hamstring problem from a move when he's had to tackle that was completely offside. And I find it so frustrating. I know it's very much a VAR thing. It's to allow that to do its job. But I, f I worry that at some point there's going to be a really horrendous injury. It might be that, uh, I don't know, player runs through because the flag's not gone up and clatters into the goalkeeper. Maybe like, like a knee to the head or something just awful. And I just hope it doesn't come to that, that they think, OK, maybe this isn't a great idea, putting needless kind of extra clashes into this game. Um, I think Guesty was saying that Godfrey at Everton had something that maybe broke his leg in a similar thing that was clearly offside. Um, obviously, it didn't change the way the, the game was officiated then but um yeah I, I, uh, frustrates me it did it, it it frustrates me all the time how long we see these moves go on and you think i'm standing here and i can see that is clearly a yard or two offside um yeah very strange but there you go so i asked postacoglu about um van der ven afterwards he said i'm not sure but he doesn't think it's anything too significant I'm, it's so disappointing for him because he was outstanding again up until that point. It's great for Radu, though, to come in. His first significant game time in a big game, and I thought he handled it really well. And Postacoglu said in his club interview, kind of slightly changed the wording. He said, no news yet, but it doesn't look significant. He obviously felt something, but speaking to him, he doesn't feel that it's anything too serious. Hopefully, he's not out for too long. And as I said at the top of this, the key in this occasion is you had Radu Dragashin to come in. Um, and I thought he was excellent. I thought it was really good. Look, he only had 14 minutes or so against 11 men. And then, obviously, uh, John McGinn decided to uh, switch his brain off. Um, and But I, so many little bits and pieces impressed me about him. He's not going to be, you know, Van der Ven pace. Van der Ven is the fastest defender the Premier League has ever, or centre-back the Premier League has ever had. Is it, or he might even be the fastest player, I can't remember now. But he's certainly just got ridiculous, like, flash-type pace. Um, so Dragashin is not going to be that kind of fast, but he does have a turn of speed. Um, and I thought he dealt with everything that was kind of put down his side. I thought technically he looked excellent. I thought he dealt with the press really well when Villa tried to press him. He played quick, fast, first-time balls to the likes of Doggy and Basuma really well. Um, and yeah, and he actually did. It was a tactical foul he did as well at one point, which got him his yellow card just to stop them breaking up the pitch. And hey, all four goals came while he was on the pitch as well. Um, you know, he ran up there and got involved in the celebrations. Nice to see kind of how involved he is in everything right now. Uh, he did, Matty Cash again had a victim, um, and that was Radu Dragashin with a very powerful cross that hit poor Radu in the bad place. The place that no man ever wants a block across with, and it was a powerful hit of a cross. Um, it was the first time I've been in a stadium when they played the replay on the four screens that Villa have got at Villa Park on, the, on each corner of the ground, and... I don't think I've ever been in a ground where collectively, I think there's 45, 50,000 people in there, all the men in the crowd went, yeah, <laughs> like that, like, ooh, got a noise. It was just, ah, oh. yeah, ouch. Fair play to Radu. He took a moment to collect himself while sat on there holding the affected area, um, but then he got up and got on with the game, and yes, all of us who have played football have had that horrendous sensation at some point. Um, but yes, never obviously experienced in a Premier League game. But uh, yeah, fair play. Fair play to uh, to take it and, uh, and crack on with it. Um, 
But yeah, no, I thought it was really good. I thought it was it's really important bearing in mind you'd imagine that even if Van der Ven feels fine, there's no need to risk him against Fulham. Let Radu Dragosin come in and and have a kind of another game to get involved as well. And and he he looked very comfortable. He looked like he's a Premier League player, and that is a quality of him, and that is why yes, it will have been frustrating for him to have come from being a regular starter at Genoa, playing week in, week out, getting loads of praise in Serie A, and then coming to Spurs and being very much a backup right now to uh, Romero and Van der Ven. But if he goes in there and plays like that and makes himself undroppable, you know, maybe Van der Ven struggles to get back in. Maybe Romero finds his place uh, in doubt. And that's the beauty of competition. And next season, fingers crossed, you know, maybe European football and I very much hope European football and there's going to be a lot of matches. He will play a lot of games. Um, and again, just 22. Him and Van der Ven, both 22. And they've got Romero, who's always he 25, leading them. Uh, they're so exciting what the future of Spurs centre-backs looks like. Um, and, you know, do you bring in another centre-back? Do you like push Ashley Phillips then on as the next centre-back? Do you have Ben Davies as an experienced kind of head as as a one to round out that group? Um, Alfie Dorrington, obviously, is, um, when he comes back from his injury, I'd imagine maybe he gets a loan next season, but he might be putting his hat in there for that as well. This preseason is going to be quite an important one for a lot of players because I don't think I think there'll be a lot of international players at the Euros and Copa America who won't be back in time for some of these earlier preseason games, um, and maybe the tour as well. So. It's a chance for some of these younger players to to throw their uh, hat in the ring um, to be considered for the future. So, yeah, very excited about the centre-back options. You know, you've got Romero, Dragosin and uh, Van der Ven. That's three top, top centre-backs that a lot of teams in pretty much world football, I think, would want. I mean, there is there's a reason Bayern Munich wanted to sign um, Radu Dragosin. Spurs got in there first, so... Uh, yeah, that was it was terrific for him. A really good kind of uh, first exposure for him to, like Postacoglu said, a big game and a decent chunk of game time. Um, watched his interview afterwards. It was, yeah, I think he's probably still got to warm up a little bit to the whole doing interviews in English thing. I've seen him do a couple before. Um, but I kind of like the fact he's a no-nonsense guy that kind of gets on with it. And, uh, yeah, maybe try and grab him in pre-season for a... For an interview, um, kind of get a bit, bit more from him, a bit more in depth. I'm sure there's a, a lot that he can say. I think he'd be quite an interesting guy with his background and the route he's come from Romania to to Italy, uh, Juventus. You know, his time there as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, but great stuff. Um, fullbacks, I thought they did both did well. Uh, Porro, like I say, a couple of really good one twos in the build up to goals with. Um, uh, Kudasevsky, you really notice the difference when they've got uh, Poro and Udogi together, the first choice fullbacks, because they're just so essential to the Postacoglu system, the way they can play out wide with their raids down the flanks, but also their ability to come inside. A doggy, like I say, just kept going up and down the left hand side, and obviously we saw what happened with McGinn. Um, both defended really well. There were a few moments, like I said earlier, when they had to come inside and and really kind of mop up around the box. Um, and yeah, I just think the defence as a whole did really well. And I do wonder, it just felt again to me another example of why Spurs, I think, have to have really similar fullbacks as the backups for these uh, for Porro and Adogi. Um Because you want, very similar to how Dragosin came on and replaced Van der Ven, and it was pretty much seamless. That's kind of what you want from the fullbacks. And right now, the two fullbacks that have come in, obviously Emerson and Ben Davies, they're more functional than similar. Um, and they may well still have a part at Spurs in differing roles or or whatever. But I feel like if I'm Postacoglu, I'm probably thinking I would like a like for like to go in there. Um, and, and so that way we can rotate and we can change them up for midweek games without the system being compromised in any way. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But, yeah, for the defence, it was important. Uh, Postacoglu said it was really important to limit Villa's chances. We worked really hard 
without the ball as a collective, but at times this year we've let ourselves down in terms of conceding from areas where we shouldn't, but the focus has been really good. Obviously, Mickey's out today, but it's good when you get settled back four as well, and that plays a significant difference in the middle of the year when we were chopping and changing, so it's hard for us to maintain consistency. They're obviously a threat. Ollie Watkins having an outstanding year. Today he was a threat, but I just think we handled it really, really well. Vic only had a couple of moments he needed to be involved. He did that really well. Our two fullbacks were outstanding in the way they swung across. The centre-backs did a great job. Um, yeah, Vicari only had a couple of kind of moments of note, a couple of brave moments. There was one where he dived at someone's feet. There was another moment at the back post when he dived in and got a bit of a stud to the back of his head, which he had to have all that kind of globbed stuff put on the back of his head just to make sure nothing, uh, no blood got out. And then after the game, you might have seen Hoybier put up a, an image of um, him. I'm trying to remember who the other player was now. There was a few of them, but it had... Um, uh, uh, Vicario um, with a like an ice bag on his head, it looked like a tea cozy kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was quite funny. But as long as he's all right, that's the main thing. I thought Hoybier came on and did as well. He did another couple of uh, kind of. I know it was against ten men, but it did a couple of kind of charging runs through the middle that uh, resulted in chances as well. Uh, but yeah, defense. It was a big day for them uh, to get that clean sheet. I thought it was quite important for Matt Wells, who obviously is a very talented young coach who works with them a lot of not only their defensive play, but their transition out of defence into attack. Um, Mila Yedinak as well, who's uh, gone runs through the coaching set pieces with them, uh, the defensive ones. Um, Postacoglu said on Friday that he's a scary guy and that's why he wanted him in the role. Um, and yeah, you know, they came to one of the toughest places in the Premier League against one of the best attacks in the Premier League this season. They shut them out, and that's all you can ask of them. And, and hopefully, that does lead to uh, to more consistent performances like that as well. So um, yeah, now I guess to what comes next. Um, Postecoglou, the running joke right now in the press conferences is that you dare not mention uh, the top four. If you if you mention anything about going for the top four, uh, he yeah he doesn't um, how do I put this yeah it's it's uh, it, it, it's a running theme right now where he won't accept that that's what they should be limited to and he refuses to accept that as well um, because look just an example yesterday after in the press conference uh, one of the reporters kind of mentioned to him about the fact that you know. They were coming from a goal difference that was four behind on the day uh, to Villa. And at the end of the day, two better than Villa. Um, and so it was asked, you know, could that goal difference, uh, and especially if they keep improving it, play a part at the end of the season? And he kind of looked with a bit of a grin. He said, could play a part in what? Um, and the response came back, you know, well, the battle between you and Villa. Uh, very reluctantly, that reporter clearly knew what was coming next. And he said, oh, you're keeping us there, are you? Yeah, OK, no worries. As if to say, that's all we can do, is it? The top four race. Um, and, you know, yes, there's a bit of a glint in his eye and a kind of a smile as he does it. But I just think it is. it comes from this <clears throat> desire to not be told what he is or what Spurs are. No one outside the club is going to define what Spurs can do and what they can be. Uh, I like that. I do. Um, it does mean that sometimes he can be very contrary. Uh, I think I've said this before. Um, he doesn't want you to to think that you've worked him out. You've figured out what a postal glue team is or anything like that. I mean, a little example for you. In Friday's press conference, just as an example with, uh, of a recent one, he um, one reporter asked him towards the end of the first section of the press conference about how important Champions League football could be to developing his squad. To which Ange replied, it's not actually. Ten minutes later or so, in the separate section, the embargoed written section of the press conference, he was asked about European football by another reporter, to which he said, I do believe it's important for our growth. Um, and it's just funny, sometimes it's the way you say it. I think someone put a comment or a question underneath my last video saying something along those lines of like, with... He, he does seem like a guy that will try to say the opposite sometimes to what you're trying to say it is, as in any journalist, is that difficult? And it's not really, because 
quite a few managers do that. They they like to be a little bit contrary, and sometimes you can guide them to saying what you actually know they want to say or you want them to say by just saying the opposite and taking the hit. Um, but yeah, I think on the whole, it is born from this place of fostering a belief within the club not to settle for a top four spot. Like why? Why? Why is that the thing? Like like you said on Friday, you know. Trying to strive for Champions League football shouldn't be a thing. Um, because I know some people have got the belief that it, obviously it brings in money. Does it help you attract better players? Maybe in some cases, not always. Um, otherwise, you know, Dragosian would have come to, gone to Bayern rather than Spurs. Um, doesn't really, you know, it's, it doesn't always work like that. Lucas Bergville would have gone to Barcelona rather than Spurs. Um, but it is about understanding that being in the Champions League should be part of a bigger thing. Uh, and he made a point on Friday of saying, and I think he kind of seemed to be talking about Man U and Newcastle, it's like, oh yeah, well it's great that they've been in the Champions League, but it just meant essentially one season of it, that they may not get in there again. Uh, and, and yeah, and I agree with him, I think that that's true. I do think a lot of importance is placed on trying to get into the Champions League, and I think it's a financial thing as well, more than anything. Whereas for him, he's placing all of the importance on growing this team and turning them into someone that can challenge uh, next season and the years to come as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it, really. And he's got this kind of view, I think, that has to be throughout the club that you aim for the top. And one only, strictly only, if that is mathematically impossible, do you lower your next target to what's below it. Um, so right now... Yeah, he's not thinking about a top four. He's thinking above that. Uh, and I mean, look, I'm not going to get carried away or anything. I'm not going to kind of go overboard. But all I'm saying is in terms of the fixtures, because of the quirk of the calendar now where you've got the FA Cup games, it, the top three aren't playing for a little while, um, which means that if Spurs were to win at Craven Cottage against Fulham, which isn't a given at all, Spurs, I've seen them go there and struggle at times, um, if they were to win that and then they were able to beat Luton at home, the top three would all return to a Premier League table um, after the international break or a week after the international break that would have Tottenham five points off the top of the table. So I can kind of understand where he's coming from in terms of why limit yourself until you can officially no longer achieve whatever it is. Because, yeah, five points off the top, and then suddenly, with a lot of these top teams playing each other, um, and really difficult games come out, and Spurs playing all of these top teams as well, why should you, yeah, stick a ceiling on your ambitions right now? Um, and look, I don't think anyone is genuinely putting Spurs in the title race, but I do love the idea of not taking yourself out of it until it's mathematically impossible. Who knows? Who knows? Hey, we spoke about Arthur Rowe earlier. You never, never know. You can't rule it out until you can rule it out, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, look, it's a team in growth. We know it's, it, yeah, realistically, it's probably not going to happen. Um, but hey, if Spurs going to hang in and around there, it's only going to, as a byproduct, ensure that they do finish in the top four. Villa have got tough games coming up. Villa have got to play a, a fair whack of the same teams that Spurs have got to play, but some of them are away when Spurs are playing at home. Um, and obviously, if Villa can get past Ajax, they're going to have loads more games chucked in their schedule as well if they keep going in the uh, Conference League as well. So, uh, yeah, for, for Postacoglu... I think he's excited about, like I said earlier, how many goals Spurs could score if they can sort out that end of the pitch properly. Uh, he said, what's important for us and yesterday is that I thought we scored four good goals from four key players who need to be scoring for us. I keep saying that's the area of the park where I don't think we've got bang for our buck, considering how hard we work on that front third. Even today, I thought we had more opportunities to score, but it was just I was just really pleased in the execution of all our goals and the players who got them. That's more important. We can be a team that scores a lot of goals, but we're still a work in progress in that area. So to get four goals and away from home and the players who scored them was more important and the execution of them was really pleasing. I still think there's a significant part of the season to go. There's still 11 games for us anyway. 
Uh, there's so many challenging games, and every game will have meaning between now and the end, not just for us, but for every team. There's a fight up at the top, there's a fight down at the bottom, there's a fight in the middle somewhere, so we're all fighting for something. If we had lost today, I don't think that would have discounted us, whatever other people put on us as targets. I've been consistent in saying what's important for me is our growth as a team, and I thought we saw that today. It was another positive step forward for us. Um, and yeah, I like the fact that I think some of recent managers have been a bit depressingly realistic. I've understood where they're coming from, but let's be honest, we want to dream, we want to believe, we want to get excited about the football team, um, and we don't want to be told how rubbish we are and things like that. Uh, and I like the fact that, I mean, you know, Postacoglu after the game yesterday said about the performance, get excited, why not? The supporters, if they don't get excited by a performance and a result like that in what was a significant game, you've just got to enjoy it. We know every game is a challenge in the Premier League, especially a team like ours who are trying to gain an identity. The next step for us is to maintain a consistency of quality performances. And I just thought it was really fitting that that kind of display came this week. You know, in a week where Spurs have once again showcased their all too familiar habit of undoing any good work that's going on on the pitch by making decisions that are very unpopular off them. Um, you know, you had a game where. Postacoglu was at least showing his side of things and what he can do for the club. And it's not the first time he did it. He did it back in July when the club came out with the, you know, um, the announcement they were going to raise match day ticket prices, general ones. Um, it was left. That was after a nice little build up and excitement around Postacoglu, and they went slap. And he kind of then had to spend the start of the season building everyone's belief and excitement about the club back up again. And it kind of felt like this week, you know, you get the 6% price increase, um, which I think, although it's, you know, for a club that has the most, one well, among the most expensive season tickets in the world, 6% increase is never kind of going to go down well in any way and, and shouldn't I understand that but obviously it came within the context of all other clubs pretty much have raised their prices and many of them by higher percentages but I think the kicker the kicker was the removal from 25-26 season of the senior concession season tickets for new applicants so all of those people who are being penalised for supporting the club for years it's like oh well, well done well done for supporting them for all of those decades yeah, we're not going to, uh, even though your income may be reduced when you're 66, yeah, we're not going to help you anymore. Uh, and those who already are over that age, they're going to have their discount kind of like whacked for that 5% off at a time or whatever it is over a, a series of years. And it's uh, such a weird thing to do. Um, their logic, and I'm trying to see where they're coming from, is that it's a bit unsustainable because they've got four times the amount of senior concession tickets than they had at uh, season tickets at, uh, that they had at White Hart Lane and and you know I mean but but what what sorry there's too many of you old people you know <laughs> are you still here um it, it's yeah it went down exactly as expected um and I just thought that and I wonder if I just saw that Arsenal did the same and just thought yes we can do that as well now um, and it's just, yeah, it has. It's gone down like an absolute lead balloon as well. Um, and again, Postacoglu has had to come out in this role as a, look, you want something to smile about? Look at my team. Um, and that's exactly what they did. And uh, he was quite interesting on Friday. He was asked about it. And, and he said, look, it's, it's not in my role to kind of do anything to do with that sort of stuff. But he also made it clear that if supporters are unhappy with something, they've got every right to express that, which I'm sure, yeah, did not go down too well at the hierarchy of the club. <laughs> Don't tell them to be angry. Um, you know, it's just... But he was kind of stating the obvious. He is. He was saying, look, it's not my job to tell people how to feel. Um, he just said it's his role is to produce a football team that gives them the hope and belief and something to smile about at the end of the week. And that's what he's doing. And not just the men's team. You know, Robert Villaham's um, women's team. Brilliant this weekend. You know, made history. 
Women's FA Cup, they're through to the semi-finals. First time it's ever happened for the club. Amazing. Beat Man City in the quarter-final. Really exciting, dramatic penalty shootout. Becky Spencer, the absolute hero with two terrific saves. Um, and they're through it. It's the men and women uh, and the academy side doing a lot of good work as well. Um, it's almost like everything that's going on off the pitch you can kind of now trust on what's happening on the pitch to at least put a smile on people's faces. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you can still smile. They won't cost you any more just to smile at least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. What a club. What a club. Only Tottenham Hotspur can kind of try to run and shoot themselves in the foot all at the same time. Um, I'm intrigued to see kind of what comes of all of that and, and whether... The goodwill from the football ends up, and the and the desire, I guess, maybe for the fans to be unified behind the team. Kind of, I don't know, I don't know. We'll see. It's it's a difficult one because um, yeah, there is there is a lot of disgruntlement about it, and I think rightly so, especially with the senior stuff. That's the stuff that that really kind of yeah, I, I find it's not it doesn't leave a nice taste in the mouth i think that's the thing for me it's um i see their reasoning for it but it doesn't make it any more palatable for me to to kind of hit the people with the reduced income that that makes yeah no real sense and especially at a club that has um such a high revenue from games that uh yeah I mean, if you're just saying that you want younger, higher paying ticket holders, it's just not football. That's, it's, you know, I don't like that concept of pushing out the uh, the older kind of fans because maybe they can't afford it. And, and, you know, I spoke to a lot of people back in July who said that the general ticket prices is going up made it even more difficult to bring a family anyway to football. So if you're not getting the younger people because of that, the older people get start to get priced out of it. You are going to end up with a stadium full of just very wealthy kind of business types or one day tripper kind of tourist fans and everything. And and we know how difficult that would then be to to create the atmosphere you want. It's yeah, I don't think it's been entirely thought out to be honest with you. Um, what else was I going to talk about? I was going to do another video this week, so I will do. I'm going to, like I said in the last video, I'm going to try and make that a thing now just to split some other stuff so that the weekend can kind of be about match analysis. Uh, Midweek, we'll do like a loan roundup. I'll answer any of your questions that you might ask in a week and any little bits and pieces that come up in a week so I don't then need to talk about them uh, later on and when they date a bit in the next weekend video. Uh, the only thing I am going to quickly talk about, only because I thought it was just really nice, uh, very quickly, Richardson and Emerson have done a. Um, do you remember I, I spoke about they uh, did this? They saw a little snippet of a video where they um, Richardson revealed about uh, his bit of a faux pas in a meeting, team meeting with Antonio Conte. Well, the full video now that that was like almost a teaser to, uh, although it was a slightly different kind of part of Emerson's house it took part in, has now come out. Uh, and it's really nice. I watched it with subtitles. It's Emerson and Richardson sitting on Emerson's couch in his house talking to the Brazilian influencer Fred, uh, whose YouTube channel is called uh, Desimpedidos. Um, and it was just a really funny, nice chat. And do you know what? Richardson comes across very well, but I actually thought Emerson just came across brilliantly. He came across as such a lovely guy. Um I honestly, even with the subtitles, which work for about 90-95% of the time, I really recommend watching it. It was, it was it's a lovely video. Um there were little fun moments like they asked they were asked like who's the most Brazilian of the non-Brazilians? And the answer was Basuma. Um they said he's all Brazilian. He likes our stuff, everything we have, both the good and the bad he likes. He likes to go out, he likes everything, he is different. And then they were both asked whether they would take him back to Brazil for a trip. And they were like, no, 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 no. Uh, Emerson said, I wouldn't take him. He'd get arrested there. And it would be my fault. He would mess things up a lot. And Richardson said, yeah, yeah, no, I don't want that responsibility. They were asked about Sonny. Uh, Emerson said, he, the man tries to speak Portuguese, tries to speak Spanish. 
He had to say he's very similar to us Brazilians. He like like his self-esteem, his way of living life. He's a buddy. I really like him. Now he's our captain, so now he's even more. He took on that responsibility even more. Richarlison said about him, yeah, he guides, yes. Maybe not as much as Harry Kane, but he talks a lot. Um, of course, he has a big responsibility too because he's been with Tottenham for many years. So he's always the guy who has to take on the responsibility with us. And there was a brilliant little bit about Romero. Uh, essentially they were asked, who's the team's unofficial bodyguard? Like, who would have your back in an instant? And they both said Romero, without question. Uh, and they also spoke about the way Romero hurts people. Um, they said, um, it talks about him in training as well. And the way he is in training and football, he said, Emerson, uh, sorry, Richardson said, he knows how to hit. He hits without getting booked. It's ball and shin that he takes. Emerson, Emerson said, I've seen few people hit like him in my life. He almost breaks your leg, but he gets the ball and comes out clean. He does it on purpose, but he knows how to hit. Like there are people who hit, but they commit a lot of fouls. But you can see that he hits. He hurts the guy, but you can only see it later that he actually caught the guy's ankle. Uh, and in training, it's the same. This is Richardson. In training, it's the same thing. In training, you have to get the ball and then move right away. As in otherwise, he'll get you. Um, and it was quite interesting. Uh, Emerson revealed that he used to, R Romero used to go for Richardson a fair bit and now doesn't at all. He said he doesn't hit everyone in training. Romero fixates on something and then he wants to get the guy. But it's not just anyone he hits in training. And he said he won't hit you. And he kind of nodded at Richarlison. He said in the beginning when he arrived, he would hit Richarlison because they had a kind of a rivalry, but then it became calm. It's almost like he kind of had to earn his respect um, this idea of Romero that he will batter you until you get his respect and once you earn his respect you've got him for life he is your in your corner he is your backup he is your bodyguard he is there for you and uh, yeah I kind of like that and again another game with no yellow card for Romero as well so he is maturing all the time as well and Postacoglu said the other day he just loves how competitive Romero is and and the way if he could everyone could put themselves into their football the way Romero does, you know, just having this incredible squad. Um and Richard uh, sorry, Emerson admitted that he uses more words than his studs to rile up the opposition as in himself. He said there's a lot of cheeky guys in the Premier League. I myself am the worst on the field for that. Uh I swear if I played against myself, Royale against Royale, I would kill myself, beat myself up. I'm very annoying. Richard said, he is cheeky. I played against him. Everton against Tottenham, he's too cheeky. I cursed him. Cursed him in Portuguese. Um, and there's some kind of really nice stuff that it's far too long and it kind of, I'm not going to do it any justice in going into. But I generally have a little look. Up, uh, uh, there's an article on my Twitter account I put out today. Um, and obviously, if you want to watch the video, there's a really kind of long stuff about um, Emerson talking about the fans booing him, the Spurs fans, and kind of how he had to come through that, how difficult he found it at the time, um, kind of how it how it hurt him, how he had to kind of work his way back, fight back, work harder, come back and try and kind of win their love. And he loves the fact that they'll now sing his song to the uh, the strains of Give It Up by Casey and the Sunshine Band. Um, Richardson really opened up about how difficult it was for him when he had his uh, the the pubis injury that he had early on, the groin problem he had, um, and how kind of difficult and the mental health struggles as well. And they both spoke about, yeah, speaking. and sp They both have spoken to kind of therapists or counsellors to talk about kind of uh, getting these difficult feelings out and kind of moving on from them. And I love the way Emerson kind of spoke about how he could see that Richardson was in a bad way in terms of just just staying in his house too much, not getting out there. And he really made a point of deliberately getting him over to his house because he has a lot of his cousins around. It's a bigger kind of group atmosphere and getting him involved. And now a lot of those same people can all say that Richardson is like a different guy now. He's, he's really transformed by this kind of community he's, he's found himself within and he's more open and sharing and and just speaking to you know uh, kind of someone that just just under just can get them to talk you know talk to a therapist and just it's just opened up so much more of Richarlison and uh, yeah you know you can really see how much pride Emerson gets from 
the transformation of Richarlison. And it's no coincidence that he's, you know, whatever he's got this season, 10 goals, 3 assists, whatever it is, it's because he's a happier player. Um, and, it, and he's been able to fix a lot of these issues. Honestly, I, I really recommend listening to it or reading it, whatever. Um, it, it's really interesting. And like I say, Emerson comes across brilliantly. And Richarlison comes across a guy that has, has really come on a journey as well. So, um, yeah. But honestly, if I read out the quotes, they're, they're huge. I'd be talking for another 10 minutes or so just reading stuff out, which there's no need, for do when, no need to do when you can read it yourself. So, uh, so yeah, like I say, I will come back with a second video uh, just to mop up everything in the week and to talk about the loan players. Some interesting little bits and pieces have gone on loan. Uh, 13 players out on loan, um, and there'll be more in the week. Uh, we can talk about the Fulham game. And as always, yeah, get your questions in. I, d I do enjoy ans answering your questions, whether it be about football or whatever, movies, TV, whatever you want to talk about. Um, I had another late night. I was daft. I got up really early to get to the game yesterday. Had very little sleep, only about five hours sleep or so. And then I got to the end of last night and I was like, oh, I really want to watch the Oscars. <laughs> I ended up like a right baby sitting up and watching those. So I'm absolutely knackered today. Because obviously I had to work today as well. So, um, yeah, but I had enough about that. What, what a, you know, first world problems, isn't it? It really is. You know, going to a Premier League game and watching the Oscars. Oh no, what a life. Um, so, yeah, right, time to head off. But yeah, nice, happy chat. Loads of good stuff to talk about there in terms of positive things. But, like I say, they've got to go, then go to Craven Cottage and absolutely back that up with another victory. And, um, keep this momentum going and, and who knows what the rest of this season will bring um so yeah time to head off as always stay healthy stay safe look after yourselves and i shall catch you later goodbye